Hi everyone. For the second part of decolonization, we're going to be looking at the decolonization of Africa. The roots of the decolonization movement in Africa can be traced back to the late 19th and early 20th century centuries when nationalist and anti-colonial movements began to emerge. These movements were inspired by a range of factors, including the desire for self-rule, the rejection of European domination, and the quest for national identity and unity. The two world wars also played a role in the decolonization movement as they weakened the economic and political power of the colonial powers. <clears throat> and created new opportunities for resistance and rebellion. One of the most important factors in the decolonization of Africa was the emergence of strong nation nationalist movements, which, led by, which were led by charismatic leaders such as Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, Jomo Kenyatta in Kenya, and Julius Nyerere in Tanzania. These leaders galvanized popular support for independence through speech, rallies, and protest, and they mobilized their followers to challenge the colonial authorities and demand self-rule. One of the primary factors that contributed to the decolonization in Africa was the rising tide of nationalism that swept across the continent in the wake of World War II. African intellectuals, politicians, and activists began to agitate for greater political autonomy and the right to govern themselves. This was driven in part by the growing recognition of the injustices of colonial rule and the belief that Africa's future lay in self-determination. Another key factor in the decolonization of Africa was the changing international context. As the Cold War intensified, the United Nations became a more influential forum for international politics. The Soviet Union and the United States both sought to gain influence in Africa, and they provided support for nationalist movements that were willing to align with their interests. <clears throat> the United Nations also played an important role as it put pressure on colonial powers to grant independence to their African colonies and provided a platform for African leaders to make their case for self-rule. <clears throat> so Africa's political revolution has been one of the most dramatic international phenomena since the war. So within a few years, over 30 new nations were born. <clears throat> the continent was transformed from a European imperialist, imperialist preserve into a mosaic of African states. Now we're going to look at the eve of revolution. The two world wars profoundly affected millions of Africans. In the first war, fighting was widespread in and around the German colonies. Extensive campaigns were mounted in the south in southwest Africa, Togoland, the Cameroons, and East Africa. While there was a revolt in South Africa, and Britain declared a protectorate in Egypt. So now, the opposition to European, European rule was not yet sufficiently sophisticated to tempt Africans into taking advantage of the embarrassment of the imperialists and rebelling whilst they um, were occupied in warfare. So most Africans provided, surprisingly, um, they were... They, surprisingly, they were loyal to whichever European power ruled them, serving alike in the forces of Germany, Britain, 
France and Belgium. So the first and the second um, war provided the wartime value <clears throat> of Africa to Europe. So there are two <clears throat> international conceptions that interested a handful of African intellectuals. <coughs> Excuse me. So African society was not yet sufficiently organized in 1919 and years for and, and the years following, but the concept of the right of self-determination changed the character of international relations. So now the principle of self-determination has <clears throat> a very long and complex history with roots in the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. The idea that nations should be free to govern themselves without external interference gained momentum during the 19th century as nationalist movements spread throughout Europe. So now in the aftermath of, the, of World War I, the principle of self-determination gained prominence in the international stage, right? Um, Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States at the time, championed for self-determination as a means of creating a more stable and a just world order. So at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, Wilson's 14 points included a call <coughs> for the self-determination of peoples which was seen as a challenge to the European colonial powers. The principles of self-determination were enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations, which was signed <clears throat> in 1945. So Article 1 of the Charter states that the purpose of the UN is to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of people. So this concept interested a handful of African intellectuals and those progressive in the, metropol in the metropolitan countries. <clears throat> it indirectly refuted imperialist assumptions. Now, for example, the rights of Belgians to freedom from Ghana rule implied the same right for Africans to free themselves from British, French, Belgian, and Portuguese imperialism. <coughs> <coughs> so now the second product of the European war, which interested Africans, was the new mandate idea of the League of Nations. Article 22 <coughs> of the covenant declared that the covenant being um, referred to is the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is a treaty adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1966 and came in force in 1976. So now, as I was saying, the second product of the European war which interested Africans was a new mandate idea of the League of Nations. Article 22 of the covenant declared that the well-being and development of peoples not yet able to stand by themselves under the strain, strenuous conditions of the mo modern world from a sacred trust of civilization <clears throat> so now what does this mean so imperial powers bore a responsibility to develop their colonies for the benefit of the subject people and the wider civilized world. It was in accord, it was in accord with these sentiments that the Devonshire Declaration in 1923 laid down the, that primarily Kenya is African territory, <clears throat> where African interests must be considered paramount whenever they might be in conflict with those of other inhabitants. The same conception of imperial responsibility to subject people was to lead Britain to pass 
her first Colonial Development Act in 1929 and extend its scope and finances in the Development and Welfare Act of 1940. For the first time, the well-being of colonial peoples became officially recognized as a responsibility of imperial government. <clears throat> so now slowly and meagerly, the governments introduced medical, educational, social, and economic facilities for the direct benefit of their subjects. So <clears throat> the cynic would say that this was for their own self-interest in the future. But whatever the reasons or motives were, um, the social and economic activity, it made possible for the growth of African public consciousness, which was to make radical change possible. There was a stimulation of social consciousness, right? <coughs> <coughs> so now, what did this new economic development do so this new economic development inevitably brought with it urban growth an aggregation of workers and a stimulation of social consciousness new towns grew and others multiplied in population repeated attempts were made to form trade unions that were often repressed by the colonial government but this did Provide modern, this provided modern social experience for those who made the attempt. There was a wholesale, a wholesale, wholesale variety of religious movements that sprang up expressing a social frustration, <clears throat> which was to find eventual outlet in political activity. Newspapers made their appearance for the first time on any considerable scale, whilst various intellectuals and quasi-political associations began to develop. There is a group of African intellectuals who appear. <coughs> they start to influence the semi-literate masses. In India, a century earlier, education was the forerunner of self-government. <clears throat> Once the British, the French, and the Belgians began to teach, they had to use the language and ideas current in their own democracies. Once an education system was started, it gathered its own momentum. The missionaries might have taught the Bible, but their pupils used the knowledge of words to read about the ideas of the French Revolution or the Covenant of the League of Nations. There were colonial students in Europe, North America, and they took back to Africa an interpretation of the world society drawn from personal experience. Many returned um, with messages of revolutionary import. So they encountered new attitudes, absorbed fresh ideas, and return, returned home unwilling to accept previous conditions. They were, sh they were <clears throat> shattering the idea that Europeans and Americans were superior gentlemen, and leaders of independence movements were often um, the Western educated elite. <clears throat> Now we are going to look at how was independence um, further look into how it was achieved. So the situation in the various African territories in 1945 was strongly conditioned by the different forms of European rule practice over the past 50 years. The European imperial powers had not governed their colonies um, <clears throat> along identical lines, <coughs> and the differences in their approach were to actually affect the post-war development of the African subjects. It had become difficult and expensive for the European powers to hold on to their colonial possessions. Above all, the European imperial powers had exhausted most 
of their treasure during the war. They needed to develop new wealth in their colonies, but this would be possible in peace. Despite their tremendous military power, they could not afford to maintain expensive colonial garrisons, nor face the danger of extensive colonial wars. Um, the people now were demanding peace, social security, and prosperity. So that's economic, social, economic, social, and political factors all combined um, to prepare a suitable ground for an assault on continued European domination of Africa. So now some transitions were peaceful. Ghana was the first to declare independence in sub-Saharan Africa under the leadership of Kwame Nkrumah. <clears throat> some tr transitions were violent. Algeria fought against France in a long and bloody war. In Kenya, a rebel group called the Mau, <clears throat> Mau Mau terrorized British settlers in Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta was arrested and jailed. Kenya, Kenyatta later became the first president of Kenya. <clears throat> so now we're going to look at West Africa. So the revolt against the established imperial order which swept Western Africa after the war, was first planned in Europe. Interesting, hey? At the Paris Constituate Assembly in the late 1945, and in the Manchester Pan-African Congress, meeting almost simultaneously, campaign plans were hammered out that were to transform West Africa. In Paris, the representatives of French West Africa concentrated on seeking equal status for their people with white Frenchmen. In Manchester, Africans from British territories quoted the Atlantic Charter and the Four Freedoms as their text for the campaign against, the imperi against imperial rule. <clears throat> it was no coincidence which took French and British Africans to the metropolitan countries. Leopold Sedar Senghor, M. Lamain Gouye, Fili Dabo Sissoko, Yassine Diallo, Felix Hapot, Boigny, <coughs> <coughs> New Paris, as well as the New Dakar, Abidjan, and Bamako. These guys were political leaders, they were writers. Felix Hapot, Boigny, was the former president of the Ivory Coast, <clears throat> Leopold Sedar Senghor, was a Senegalese poet, politician, and cultural theorist who was the first president of Senegal. <clears throat> Kwame Nkrumah and, Na and Namzi Azikwe were accustomed to the life and talk of London as well as that of Akka and Lagos. <clears throat> so, from the early days of imperialism in Africa in the 19th century, there had been nationalist politicians and political movements. <clears throat> the Aborigines Rights Protection Society was founded in 1897, originally to protest over land issues. Pro Professor W.E.B. Du Bois, the American, had been organizing Pan-African conferences since 19th um, <clears throat> century and that of 1945, with the sixth in, in this succession. <coughs> <clears throat> so, the 1920 National Congress of British West Africa, under the inspiration of J. E. Casely Hayford, a Gold Coast lawyer, aimed at some form of unity between the four British West African colonies. An objective visualized in even more radical terms by the West African Youth League of the following decades. In French West Africa, political activity 
<clears throat> was usually promoted by metropolitan parties, of which the Senegalese section of the French Socialist Party, the SFIO, was prominent. Pre-1939 was essentially one of the bourgeoisie intellectual cosmopolitanism. African political activists thought in broad idealistic terms, aspired to recognition within international intellectual society, but only had thin contact with the social and economic life of their own people. So this generation of activists were made up of lawyers, doctors, teachers, journalists. They looked for a greater chance of inclusion <clears throat> within the imperialist system. This was the second generation. These are the guys that demanded increased representation in councils, better opportunities in government service, increased educational facilities. So now, <clears throat> it was in the 1930s that the first site of modern militant political activities appeared in the 1930s. Student groups in London, Paris, and America, youth movements in West Africa itself, the appearance of a radical popular press associated <clears throat> with such names as Azikwe and Wallace Johnson combined to stimulate militant programs and a higher degree of organization. Um, Benjamin, Benjamin, um, Benjamin Namdi Azikwe, <clears throat> was actually one of the leading figures of modern Nigerian nationalism. He was head of state in Nigeria from 1963 to 1966. He served as the second and the last governor general from 1960 to 1963 and the first president of Nigeria from 1963 to 1966, holding the presidency throughout the Nigerian First Republic. And Wallace Johnson, he worked in various commercial establishments until 1913, when he became a clerk for the colonial government. Um, bureaucratic career, his bureaucratic career, Wallace Johnson's talents as an organizer and public speaker quickly propelled him to a position of leadership. Um, at the customs department, he organized the first trade union in Sierra Leone among temporary custom office, customs officers. When he called for a strike in 1914, he was fired. He entered the British Army in 1915 as a clerk in the, I think, Courier Corps. Returning to Sierra Leone in 1920, he worked for the Freetown City Council but resigned in 1926 to reserve, to serve on the United States merchant ship. And then he published the Seafarer, an occasional journal of maritime labor news, then joined the staff of the Lagos Daily Times. Um, Wallace Johnson first came to the attention of the Moscow Comintern, Comintern. <coughs> <coughs> In 1930, at an international conference of Negro workers in Hamburg, Germany, identified by a British, he was identified as a British, um, as an agitator and potential troublemaker. He was arrested. <coughs> <coughs> Along with Azikwe for writing and publishing. Um, and then he was Convicted, he appealed and lost, and he appealed to Great Britain's Privy Council in England. Wallace Johnson attracted a lot of attention and support, <clears throat> leading British left wing intellectuals and politicians. It was a big deal. Um, he also intensified his contact with jo um, George Padmore and Jomo Kenyatta and C.L.R. James and others affiliated with the newly established International African Service Bureau. Wallace Johnson became the editor of Afri um, became editor of the Africa and the World <clears throat> and with Padamo um, of the African Sentinel, Sentinel. So in April 1938, Wallace Johnson re 
returned to Freetown, intended, uh, intending to make his stay a short one, but customs agents seized about 2,000 copies of the African Sentinel, um, which is a paper at that time, which he was bringing to Sierra Leone. This resulting publicity drew crowds to his series of public lectures. His ability to speak in public was very eloquent. <clears throat> he was brilliant. His targets were always well chosen. And um, he was always ready to lead the population when it comes to leadership. And then um, less than three weeks after his arrival, after his arrival, blasted by, um, he was blasted by a, a mass following. Wallace Johnson um, inaugurated the West African Youth League, the first effective large-scale political movement in Sierra Leone history. <clears throat> Supported by wage earners and the unemployed, the Youth League swept two elections in a row, the Freetown Municipal Council elections in 1938 and the Legislative Council elections in 1939. So these successes, plus Wallace Johnson's charismatic effect on the masses, his unrelenting exposure of labor um, exploitation, and his uncanny ability to discredit the colonial government, <clears throat> as you can imagine, further angered the British um, officials. Fearing that Wallace Johnson would stir up disloyalty among African soldiers and policemen, the government enacted a series of authoritative orders in the summer of 1939, which severely limited um, his and other Sierra Leone um, Leoneans' um, liberties. And at the end of World War II, he was interned as um, undesirable. And then upon his release in 1944, <clears throat> Wallace Johnson resumed his activities immediately. He was an influential spokesman at several international conferences, particularly the 1945 Manchester Pan-African Conference. Within Sierra Leone, however, he entered a political cul-de-sac. The Youth League um, foundered, never regaining its momentum and following which it had lost um, during the war. And then after this, <coughs> <coughs> Wallace Johnson um, lost considerable um, popular support when he opposed the planned reconstitution of the Legislative Council to give majority, majority representation to the protectorate. <coughs> Although he was still very much respected and admired as a witty political critic, his stand on this issue denied him a major role in Sierra Leone's post-war independence movement. So, <clears throat> from the above, we see a fresh generation of political politi politicians who extend <clears throat> their theories beyond the limited aims of their predecessors there were new political objectives which emerged that produced the transformation in West um, African society, right? Now, we are going to look at <clears throat> uh, Ghana's, uh, Ghana's decolonization process. So Ghana became the first state in sub-Saharan Africa to gain political independence from European colonial rule in 1957. Arguably, Ghana's decolonization did not involve military confrontation, especially when compared with African countries such as Algeria and South Africa. Also, Kwame Nkrumah, one of Ghana's nationalists, was a pan-Africanist of the left wing. So in a... <clears throat> Well known, in a par paraphrase of a well known um, biblical piece, the late Ghanaian nationalist icon and foremost pan Africanist Kwame Nkrumah used to tell Ghanaians and other Africans um, the following To seek ye first the political kingdom, 
and all things else sh else shall be added unto you. So Nkrumah's point was simple. If only we could wrestle back political power and control from European self-interested rule and be the masters of our own destiny. <clears throat> Kuma and other nationalists of his generation thought that economic and cultural power would follow suit and Africa would hold its own among the community of nations in the world. So we are going to unpack the decolonization process by looking at various stages of its decolonization, right? The decolonization of um, process of Ghana. So broadly speaking, scholars have identified two kinds of nation of nationalism in West Africa. Um, there's no doubt that both were present in each country to varying degrees and both contributed either positively or negatively to the pace and style of decolonization. Significantly, they also influenced the makeup and policies of post-colonial governments. <clears throat> Let's look at the first type. So, the first type, which is ethnic nationalism, it was most notable in Nigeria, Cote, Cote d'Ivoire, and Sierra Leone. <clears throat> Characteristically, political parties were formed on regional or tribal basis. William R. Bascom identifies this form of nationalism as tribal nationalism. <clears throat> William argues, further argues that this form of nationalism hindered self-government, independence, and national unity in most, Af um, most West African states. Now, the second type of nationalism was multi-ethnic nationalism, which is typical of Ghana and Senegal. <clears throat> Characteristically, political association and parties were established on a national outlook with a national mandate. Differences were often based on ideologies or principles rather than ethnic affiliation. In Ghana, although the um, Akan speaking group formed a slight majority in the population, an Akan national, nationalism did not develop to oppose the non-Akan. Evidently, the nationalist movement in Ghana under the leadership of Kwame Nkrumah was typically manifested on a national outlook and continental orientation colored with socialist paradigm. Now, looking at the church missions education and the decolonization of Ghana, the Christian mission played many roles in colonialism. The church was an agent of imperialism. Its doctrine preaches submission to the authority in the case to the British colonial government of the Gold Coast. The church profoundly pro proclaimed civil the civilizing mission of the church and or of the colonial power. Besides evangelizing the gospel through the Bible, the church also aggressively pursued education, thereby educating many people of the Gold Coast. Evidently, this policy of educating the people was an attempt to train some of the people that would serve as clerks, messengers, etc. in the British bureaucratic setup in the colony. Paul Gifford has fittingly summarized the significant role of colonial Christian missions in the process towards independence by saying this. Important in the creation of Ghana were the Protestant missions, and Ghana's history cannot be understood apart from the elite they created. These elites became the main actors in the political decolonization process. So they also contributed to the decolonization of missions by criticizing the missionaries inter alia 
for their superiority thinking notwithstanding the two shameful world wars and by rejecting the wholesale imposition of the Western culture in the name of Christianity. So <clears throat> it is not until 1949 when the colonial government had in principle accepted the demands of the nationalists we come across a public statement issued by the Christian Council of Christianity and Political Development, which inter alia outlined the right to self-government and the relationship between church and political parties. When we look at individual Christians, the church was very much involved in nationalist movement. David Kimball, in his extensive study of the rise of Gold Coast nationalism, rightly stated this. The nationalist government could hardly have gotten underway had it not been for the remarkable work of the missions in the field of education. <coughs> so, when it comes to Kwame and Kumam, <coughs> The Christian missions provided many services to the people, which basically contributed to the foundation of independence um, in Ghana. I mean, even with um, Kwame Kumar, um, the Catholic missions did um, provide higher secondary education um, before the late 1930s, while the Protestant missions had done um, so much um, earlier. <clears throat> so now fundamentally, the church and the instrument, instrumentality of its education poli policy unexpectedly aided Ghana's decolonization. Nearly all the main leaders of successive nationalist movements were Christians. So going back to um, that point I was making um, with Nkwame Kumar, um, <clears throat> many of the leaders um, were, success, were, were of successive nationalist movements. Where they were Christians who had received their um, formation with Christian influence from Protestant mission schools. So the influence of the instrumentality of the church missions and education became epitomized in Kwame Nkrumah. Evidently, the scripture of the church influenced Nkrumah's political thoughts. Remember the scripture when he said um, earlier, seek <clears throat> ye first the kingdom, seek ye first the political kingdom and all other things shall be added to you. Um, this was a, an ad, adaptation that he made from Matthew 6, I think verse 33. Okay, so now we're going to look at the long tradition of anti-colonial protest and early nationalist movements. So organized opposition to British policies took place from the early days of colonial administration. In 1857, <clears throat> Coastal chiefs protested the imposition of poll tax, and in 1868, a confederation of Fante states, Fante states contested British inter 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 interference in their local affairs. In an effort to protect the erosion of their traditional rights, the chiefs adapted a constitution in 1871 that was to regulate relations with the British administration. The British reacted by arresting several of the chiefs. Most Gold Coast nationalist leaders were educated Africans. An organization called the Aborigines Rights Protection Society was formed in 1890s to oppose land bills that threatened traditional and land tenure. In the early 20th century, nationalists challenged the arbitrary nature of the colonial political system <coughs> which placed 
unlimited power in the hands of the governor and is appointed legislative council. <clears throat> In 1920, Joseph E. Casely Hayford, a prominent Old Coast lawyer and nationalist, organized the National Congress of British West Africa. This body of educated persons from Britain's various West African colonies <clears throat> sent a delegation to the British Colonial Office in London to argue that a colony's administration should be elected by its subjects. The British government, however, preferred to practice indirect rule, <clears throat> relying on a colony's traditional chiefs for local administration at the exclusion of educated people. In their various newspapers and at their conferences, these early nationalists nevertheless continued to urge the colonial government to initiate administrative changes. Now we're going to look at <clears throat> post-World War II and the emergence of the United Gold Coast Convention. So demands <clears throat> on the colonial government intensified after World War II in 1946, Governor Alan Burns responded by announcing radical constitutional changes that made it possible for a majority African Legislative Council to be elected. Executive power was to remain in the hands of the governor to whom the Legislative Council reported. Even so, the 1946 Constitution provided the people of the Gold Coast with a higher degree of political power than anywhere else in the in colonial Africa. <clears throat> These changes also showed nationalist leaders that their voices were being heard. <clears throat> so regardless of their shortcomings, concerted efforts to resist colonialism in Ghana were considerably effective in the sense that the attention of the colonial administrators was grabbed to the imperatives of, to the imperatives of the grievances of the people. So the, so the World War II generally contributed to the increase in the demands for forums and the outright independence. Okay, it is evident that the war, first the Bible, the Bible, the bubble, it, it has been argued that Hitler's enforcement of the superiority of the Aryan race in Europe and the world at large helped in accentuating the quest for freedom all over the world. So now... <laughs> <clears throat> Significantly, in West Africa, particularly after World War II, there was increased evolution of concerted political activities and the growth of political parties. Founded in 1947, the United Gold Coast Convention, <clears throat> the UGCC, was the first nationwide political party in Ghana to call for self-government. Its leading members included the respected lawyer Joseph B. Dankwa and the American educated socialist Kwame Nkrumah. The aim of the youth GCC was encapsulated as self-government within the shortest period of time. The UGCC drew support from educated Ghanaians, most of whom were either urban professionals or traditional chiefs. Economic dissatisfaction among the Gold Coast Africans, especially those who had served in World War II, resulted in nationwide rioting in 1948. The colonial administration accused the nationalist <clears throat> leaders of inciting the disturbances and arrested Nkuma and several others. This only served to make Nkuma a more popular figure and fueled the call for self-rule. Many imperatives and grievances aided the popularity and currency of the UGCC. This included the um, order by this included <clears throat> a the order by the British colonial administrators that the farmers cut down cocoa trees that were certifi certified as disease, 
This bred dissatisfaction among the Gold Coast farmers whose major economic activities were cocoa farming. B. The high price of imported consumer goods against which a boycott was organized in 1948. C. The fact that the ex-servicemen became unemployed since they returned from World War II. This provoked a protest march against the government in 1948. Thus, the UGCC was considered by the people as a strong party to galvanize the concerted efforts of the paint people of the Gold Coast in leading the struggle against imperialism, colonialism, tyranny, and foreign absurdity. Consequently, rioting, looting, and destruction became widespread in the colony, and the colonial government blamed the UGCC for all the disturbances. Hence, Dr. J.B. de Croix, <clears throat> and the five others were arrested and jailed. So now looking at radicalism <clears throat> and conventions, People's Party. Viewing Dakar and the other leaders um, and the other UGCC leaders as too conservative in their efforts to win independence, Kwame Kumar split with the UGCC later in 1949, and he formed his own Conventions People's Party, the CPP. Other leaders of CPP were K.A. Dema and Kojo Potso. The first objective, the party pursued towards the realization of the ultimate goal of self-government now, was coined, which was named Positive Action. <clears throat> Hence, this was a non-violent form of resistance characterized by general strikes, boycotts, and demonstrations. Kumar's watchwords was independence now, an uncompromising policy that appealed to many. The CPP drew popular support from rural and working class Ghanaians, further distancing it from the more elite UGCC. In 1915, Kumar announced his positive action campaign, which considered, consisted of a boycott of foreign businesses, business, <clears throat> non-cooperation with the government, and general workers' strike. Police services were disrupted, and when rioting occurred in Kumar and some CPP leaders were again arrested and imprisoned for sedition. <clears throat> sedition is a conduct or speech... Um, inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or monarch. So now looking at self-government and independence. A new constitution was adopted in 1951, replacing the Legislative Council with a Legislative Assembly designed to provide rural Africans greater representation. In 1951, in the 1951 elections, the CPP won a majority of seats in the Legislative Assembly. Colonial government Sir Charles Arden Clark released Kumar from prison and appointed him leader of government business. Kumar and Arden Clark transformed the colonial government into a parliamentary system. And in 1952, Kumar was elected to the newly created office of prime minister. The UGCC and several regional-based parties, including the Ashanti-dominated National Liberation Movement and the Northern People's Party, comprised the political opposition to Nkumar and the CPP. These groups opposed the new governmental structure, advocating a federalist system. In June 1953, the CPP continued its nationalist agitation by submitting a set of proposals for a new constitution to the assembly. In 1953, proposal led to the 1954 constitution, which provided for an unofficial all-African cabinet. In the election following from the constitution's introduction, <clears throat> CPP won 79 out of 104 seats, this thus paved the way for internal government um, in 1954. In 1956, the CPP tabled a motion calling for independence. This was marketly, marketedly passed by the assembly and accepted by 
the British colonial government. <clears throat> Following intense constitutional negotiations and hotly contested election, the CPP emerged on March 6, 1957 to lead the government of an independent Ghana. Kumar became the country's first prime minister, the UGCC, and several other opposition parties joined together to form the United Party. So now, in conclusion, fundamentally, many imperatives triggered the decolonization of Ghana. The decolonization of Africa was a complex and multifaceted process shaped by a range of political, social, economic, and cultural factors. The struggle for independence was an important achievement and it signaled the end of centuries of colonial domination and exploitation. However, the consequences of decolonization were also significant and the challenges facing newly independent African states were a problem for economic development. The timing and patterns of decolonizations were extremely varied. The goals of the movement in different countries were not always consistent with each other. British thinking focused on securing their continued influence by ensuring that it was they who shaped the colony's political and economic futures. After gaining independence, the African states continued to struggle with both, both economically and politically. The economic and political states of Africa after decolonization prevented the people from concentrating on Africa as a whole, and instead <clears throat> were exploited with foreign capital, only enriching, enriching foreign investors. Kuma's question in his speech is this. Can we seriously believe that the colonial powers meant these countries to be independent, viable states? And that is something I'm giving you guys something to just think about. Thank you for attending this lecture.